and welcome to yet another I'm sure that someone keeps creeping into my room at night playing around with my computer and increasing the volume on the opening credits music episode of Pottywood. Uh, I am one of your co-hosts, Steve Hester, and with me as always is... You know, I'm actually glad you just said that, Steve, <laughs> because not only was the music incredibly loud for this week, but I had forgotten I turned the volume up on my computer to try and hear if I was getting feedback of my voice on your end, and I forgot to turn it back down, so no, I'm f***ing deaf. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry about deafening you. But yeah, it does seem to be getting louder, and I don't know why. I've not been playing around with any of the settings or anything, but uh, yeah, it just keeps just keeps getting louder. There are some gremlins in your house. I'm telling you, there is, there is something's going wrong. Maybe it's a ghost, a spooky ghost. Ooh, I know. Spooky. Uh, and you think with how long we've been doing this, we would know. But speaking of how long doing things, <laughs> let's talk about Eyes Wide Shut. I wasn't expecting that. Well done. <laughs> uh, yeah. Eyes Wide Shut, the Guinness record holder for a movie with the most production days of 400 days. Sweet Jesus. And a year in post-production. Good. And I bet Bill has some story. Well, I know Bill has some stories on this. He has stories on everything. But... Uh, no, I, I didn't think we could deal with that much negativity at the beginning of an episode. Because I, I guarantee it must have been a headache for Warner Brothers. Like, Stanley, finish the movie. Oh, God. 400 <sighs> days is just excessive. Um, but then again, the movie is its almost 2 hours and 40 minutes, which coincidentally was the amount of sleep that I got the night before. So I, I came to this viewing a little bit frazzled. So I'm just frazzled. Frazzled. That wasn't the language you used at me in WhatsApp when you finally discovered the runtime of it before you sat down for it last night, Steve. <laughs> no, no, it most definitely wasn't. It began with an F, but fr it wasn't frazzled. Yes, your <laughs> messages were NC-17, put it that way. <laughs> they were rated R. Eyes Wide Shut, or as I like to call it, Boobs the Movie, um, <laughs> stars Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman as a very successful Manhattan couple. And uh, one night they have a, I suppose, an argument while they're stoned about Nicole Kidman wanting to sleep with someone else. And then Tom Cruise's character goes off into the night and through various little misadventures he ends up delving into the world of sex now let me get this right out of the way when we had john ashton on we had a discussion about what he called the fuck meter when he was working on midnight run and for if you you haven't listened to that episode go and listen to it but just give you a quick summation the fuck meter was a meter that him and Robert De Niro came up with to judge how many instances of the F word they could fit into a scene or a sentence and still have it resonate and have impact. Because if you use it too much, it loses any and all meaning. And that is the exact thing that nudity and sex has in this film. Within 10 seconds of the opening, literally the very first thing that you see after the 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 first set of title cards has gone is nicole kidman getting undressed within 20 minutes you've seen three sets of breasts and i'm not even talking kind of like all little fleeting glimpses no we're talking long lingering shots on completely naked women and by the time it gets to the orgy scene which is the key point of this movie which I always thought looking at the trailers would come at the end, but actually comes more about the midway. You're kind of numb to it. There's just so much bare flesh on offer that you start to think, well, this has stopped being in any way, shape or form erotic because there's so much of it. It's just to see a mass of just thongs and bums and boobs and, and masks. And it's, it's, it, oh, it 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 took me out of it. It really did, because <laughs> I was expecting this to be this massive erotic thriller. But I have been more aroused by porridge, <laughs> and I'm not talking about the TV show with Roddy Barker. I'm talking about a bowl of Scotch oats. 
<laughs> it was. It was just. It was just this horrible, horrible feeling where you're watching watching something and you realise no, this is just. This is just making me numb. <laughs> I've lost you, haven't I? Good and proper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, it's yes. just gonna be the next ten minutes of me laughing at that. I do apologize. <laughs> that just really got me. For of all the things that could have been ready break, I didn't think was on the list. No, Jesus. No. Uh, um, but, well, no. you've let's let's okay. Let's move on to the performances. Now, I have never been a big fan of Tom Cruise. I really haven't. But I was trying to approach this with an open mind and. An open fly. <laughs> no, actually, no. Um, Tom Cruise, in my opinion, isn't an actor. He's a movie star. And I've he, watching it, he's doing all the same kind of ticks or the same kind of quirks that he normally does when he's doing other kinds of stuff. Like like when he's at the end and he's he's talking to his friend and he's opening and closing his hands and he's doing this movement with his head, that movement with his head. And for God's sake, Tom, why on earth didn't you get a haircut before doing this movie? That bloody fringe was driving me crazy. I thought the runtime of the movie was way too long. Way too long. Have and, you ever seen a Kubrick movie? Uh, yes, I have, actually. And I, I remembered ages ago when we were discussing... I think I think, I think it was when we were... I can't remember what we were talking about. I said, but I said that I... <laughs> Oh, you right down the rabbit hole there, Steve. Oh, I know. I'd, I'd seen um, The Shining and Full Metal Jacket. Now, Full Metal Jacket is a movie where only the first half is any good. Um, the Shining, no, it is. Be honest. Every, oh, everything in boot camp is fucking brilliant. And then the second half is just, meh, whatever. Um, oh, oh, no, I'm no, not, in, yeah, not in agreement. Yeah. Not in agreement. Um, but then I also remembered last night while watching it, I'd also seen Doctor Strange Love as well. So there's okay, that. That's fair. But for me, the best part of this movie was the second half. It was everything after the orgy scene. It was everything where things were a bit sinister and you kind of get the feeling that he's being watched and his life's kind of falling falling apart to some degree but then at the end of it everything just feels so safe and rote and the ending feels so cliche and I was there thinking no this is this is supposed to come from one of the greatest filmmakers of all time and I'm, by the time the final scene's been and gone it just kind of felt like a bit of a waste of time well I'm going to say there are some things about this that I actually really like because I I do like Kubrick, and I know he has his lovers and his haters, but I, I love a director who really takes time, not as much time as he took making this movie, but actually taking mm. their time in telling a story. And mm. um, I think s some of it, the, the cinematography and stuff like the natural use of natural lighting, I really like yeah. because they, they did it really well. I thought Nicole Kidman was great in this. She was also completely underused. I wanted to see more of her throughout the movie. You couldn't have seen any more of her in that movie, Steve. True. Right in the first five seconds. True. I think um, the only thing she didn't do was go actually full frontal. Not that you saw anything full frontal anyway. No, no, you need to, to be honest. No. God, get get with the time, Steve. Come on. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's an art movie, all right? That's what it is. Uh, it's always on that line between is it art or is it arse? I guess. I mean, <laughs> the 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 only thing that really annoyed me about it when I rewatched it again, the music, the music, yeah, the music, yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, and I've never hated Strangers in the Night until it arrived in this movie. Well, that was the thing. The, was... All the, the 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 license stuff that was fine. That was great. And even like the opening piano stuff that was great. But as soon as he goes to the orgy and all you heard was <laughs> over and over it's with this room. Uncle Sid. What was he doing there? <laughs> I would Get say he's a that fat. <laughs> I would say he was having a stroke by the sound of things, but that's something completely different. Um, <laughs> God, we've got so childish with this. We're losing any respect that we might have had. My uh, mum's going to be I, listening to this. <laughs> I want to know if your mum watched it. Patricia, 
if you watch this movie, you're either going to be questioning our taste in movies or questioning what your son is doing with his mm. life. But uh, I'm questioning what I'm doing with my life. Did you watch the version with the CGI guys covering the sexual acts in the orgy scene? Uh, I don't know. Around, or did you actually see the action going um... on? Because th there's two versions of it, I believe. The, the one version that was sent out theatrically at first, they digitized some CGI guys standing around like these sex acts that you couldn't actually see how intimate they were. And then the uncut version that was released, those guys are actually gone again and you actually see the lot. So I was wondering which version of it you saw, the uncut version or the theatrical? I would say the uncut version because um, I, I got it through um, Amazon Prime. I bought it on Amazon Prime, so that's like about four quid that I'm never getting back again. Um, <laughs> yeah, and as far as I can tell, it, I, I don't remember there being much in the way of obstruction, really. I do, I, I do remember there was the one big question which <laughs> which stood out to me is, and it's already seen, everyone's got masks on, and yet yeah. there's there's two women that are performing oral sex on each other with full face masks. How on earth is that logistically possible? <laughs> you cannot do that. Unfortunately, we cannot ask Mr. Kubrick because uh, yeah. unfortunately he died four days after handing it off to Warner Brothers. Yeah. And there's, I, there's a lot of talk here that it was the finished film that was handed out. I've also heard that it was not finished. Apparently the score wasn't done, which is probably why it's so terrible. And um, sounds like a cat walking across a keyboard. We're not finalised. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the good thing about this is the fact that this was Kubrick's first movie to open at number one. Mm, really? And isn't that weird? Yes. Yeah. In the United States, I believe it's the first movie. To open at number one, which, when considering all of the movies he's made, that is so bizarre because a lot of people see this as kind of his weakest, but apparently Kubrick thought that this was actually one of his best. Right, and you know it's it, it is is kind of a shame, and I say what else is a shame. Uh, it, I couldn't hide the fact that he was not really walking around New York City streets. Oh yeah, it was all um, it was, it was all digitized, pilot. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, because Cuba famously he he hates flying. Yeah, he which, hates I mean, flying. Yeah. He he did uh, hate flying. I think he must have flown at some point because some of his earlier stuff was like shot in the states and stuff like that. So he must have flown at some point. But towards I think later in his life, he just didn't want to fly. And a lot of movies that he did, um, it was just communicating through. This is before email, really. Mm. So they'd communicate either by letters or telephone call with whoever. The one good thing about Eyes Wide Shut that I always love is uh, when it was released, was it when it was released on DVD? Yeah, uh, they came out with the box set, which had... Uh, Tissues. Fantastic. Tissues and a bottle of hand lotion. <laughs> Oh God! Oh, sorry, Mum. <laughs> I, I I dread when we get like the stuff like Lars von Trier's *Nymphomaniac* on the show. Oh Jesus! Oh God, that's that's going to be. I mean, maybe back in the day, I mean, it was seen as pretty risque. I remember the first time I saw it, it was like, I don't really see what's risque about it, really. To me, it, it, was, it was just okay. Yeah, it's a film that was centered around sex, but it wasn't as bad as I think people made it out. But you know, the the British were shocked easy back in them days, I guess. This was the days when, you know, The Exorcist and Natural Born Killers and all stuff like that was still not getting released. Oh, God, when, when was The Exorcist actually released on home I video? That was until... Until... not in 99. Was it the same year? It was 99. Yeah, it was 99. Um, Natural Born Killers came out on video in 2000 or 2001. Uh, Clockwork Orange came out in 2000 and 2001. Because Stanley Kubrick's dad, because mm. Stanley Kubrick actually wanted the movie to remain banned after some copycat people started doing what the Droogs were doing way back in the day. When he passed on, obviously, it was a case of, right, let's release it. Mm. 
Fair uh, enough. Get some money out of it. But yes, um, eyes wide shut. That was what's in the box this week. Yes. What's your, what's your, your final blurb on it? Um, more of the second half, less of the first. Uh, the actual pornography is available. <laughs> I understand that it's quite easy to to find online, so yeah. Um, one one quick question before we move on with the rest of the show: the house is that the same house that was in Batman Begins? That's an interesting question. Because it kind of looks like it, because I know the exterior of the Wayne Manor was shot over here. No, it wasn't. But you'll never guess where it was. <laughs> uh, go on. It was Lara Croft's house in Tomb Raider and the Living Daylights, which is where. Um... They do the house raid in the living daylights. So, so no, it wasn't the same as Wayne Manor, but it was uh, Croft Manor. Croft Manor. Okay. Fair enough, then. Well, listen, uh, we don't have any anniversaries this week because the anniversary for this week was actually Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. For the, for the, for the, 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 that. For, Philosopher's Rex. Yes. And we've already just done two weeks on that. So what do you guys want? So we decided, you know what? We have this absolutely amazing guest, so we're going to dedicate that time into that instead. Mm. So, let's get on with our interview, Steve-O. Yes. Well, this week, I was able to finally bring one of my favourite people to Partywood. And to achieve it, we had to travel to Canada. And we're both living after midnight tonight, which is two firsts for us both. Back in 2013, I was very fortunate to befriend an amazingly versatile actress who was already a cult figure in the world of sci-fi and had a great following due to her career of fascinating and diverse roles. Away from her acting career, our guest has been a true friend also, which led to me invading one of her podcast appearances live one evening by myself, phoning in just to say hi and put her over. Her sci-fi career has involved turns in cult series such as Lex, Highlander the Raven, The Dead Zone, her feature film roles include turns in Midway, Napoleon Dynamite, and only just last month, Dune. In voice work, she is one of the most celebrated voice actors in animation and gaming, including iconic games such as Skyrim, Yay! <laughs> Elder Scrolls, Yay! World of Warcraft, Yay! and Fallout, Yay! <laughs> as well as being the voice of Captain Phasma in Star Wars games and animation. When I discovered this, I immediately thought, of course, who else? She's the most genuine and warm-hearted person I know. Joining us from Toronto this very late hour is none other than Ellen Dubin. Good evening, Ellen. Wow. Who are you talking about? What a great career. <laughs> Such a be- Thank you for those beautiful words, guys. Oh, wow. Whew. He does a very Justin good job of buttering the guests up, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is some butter. That's the creamiest butter I've ever heard of. <laughs> you know the big problem is whenever I do these intros I actually forget to breathe when I'm doing it so at the end of it I'm just like good evening <laughs> <laughs> well they tell you that when you know you're acting and when you're doing voice work or you know on stage you must breathe so your advice is very good to yourself breathe don't forget <laughs> it's very good well Steve here is an actor as well oh of stage and mm-hmm. screen and um, uh, deleted scenes <laughs> Some very deleted scenes, yeah. Some very deleted scenes. <laughs> Been in everything from The Godfather before he was born. Yeah. But, but Ellen, uh, it's, it's been a number of years since we've known each other. And out of everyone I know in this business, like I say, you're still the champion NDA keeper I've ever met. <laughs> I can't believe no mention of you in regards to June getting out somehow. Not even to my own mother. Not even to my own mother. It was, you know what? Usually I'm okay with NDAs. I I mean, I'm really very good at it. I mean, it's part of our business. But that one was really hard to keep a secret because it's something to be so proud of. But no, you didn't know at all, did you? I didn't. And we talk (laughs) all the time. We always check in with each other. And it's like, how did did I not know this? One of my favorite (laughs) franchises. She's right there. And you are playing the role of for everyone who's going to go and see it this week. Guinea Gesserit, yes. Ancestors. Yes. Bless you. Ancestors. <laughs> At you. <laughs> well, At you to be honest, you. I mean, uh, I, I saw it on a big screen. I, I heard the voice straight away. It was unmistakable. And it was just incredible to witness. I mean, how did you end up in the, the biggest movie of the year? How were you contacted on that? 
Well, my agent sent me an audition and it wasn't called Dune at the time. It was called something else. I forget what, there's a lot of code names, you know, they have a lot of code names and it was, um, uh, maybe a minute audition that I did out of my own apartment, the same place we are speaking in now. So you can touch the air that I'm breathing (laughs) and, (laughs) and, um, literally recorded it in my little apartment here. And, uh, had no clue what it was except that word Bene Gesserit. Bene Gesserit. Yes, yes, was in there. And I looked it up and I went, oh, wowie. Oh, boy. I think this is Dune. But anyway, and I wrote to my agent and they said, yes, it is probably. But they didn't know because they don't tell them either. Flash forward maybe six months after. And uh, we recorded it. And then they told me at the time what it was. But this was two mu- almost two years ago, guys. Wow. Right. 20, 2019. Um, and then I did all kinds of different voices for them. I did sort of, I call it my Kate Blanchett read, a sort of a lyrical British read. And then a mid-Atlantic read sort of in between, not so American and not so British, sort of in between. And then I did all kinds of demon voices, which I'm an expert at, actually. It was my third demon audition in a row that week. It was very strange. I thought somebody's <laughs> trying to tell me something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, go on. Can we, can we have a little blast of the demon then? I'll give you a demon if you want. <laughs> But uh, that's not the one from the movie, so I'm not going to do the one from the movie. But, um, you know, there was a bunch of them that really, like, where somebody became a, from a sweet young thing to a crazy de- wild demon that needed to be exercised. That one's going to be coming out soon. That was a fun one. Um, and then just regular kind of creature stuff, like orc creatures type of thing, which are very prominent in video games, as you know, Steve. Oh, yes, definitely, yeah. And, and Salford yeah. as well. I am fully expecting at some point the mayor of Salford's going to get in touch and go, "Ah, come on, lads. I'll I'll be in more trouble than you. Uh, Well, Dune is, it's a huge franchise and, uh, you know, it's getting all of the buzz right now. And uh, so with yourself, you can actually lay claim to being in two of the biggest sci-fi franchises ever. Thanks to your... Well received voicing of Captain Phasma in uh, Star Wars, and uh, it's many, many incarnations. Now, as you're so loved on the sci-fi circuit, how was this role in terms of the other characters you delivered? Oh, that was an interesting, actually, occurrence. I did not audition for her. I was in a class, and I was taking um, video game and animation acting with this wonderful woman named Lindsay Halper, who is the casting director for Lucas in the United States of all the video games and most of the anime, all of the animation like Lego Star Wars and Star Wars, Star Wars resistance. Mm -hmm. And she heard me in a class and then flash forward a year later, she offered me this part. And I was very nervous because I'm not a sound alike. There are people who can imitate and act the crap out of people's voices. Like it's not my forte. And um, they gave me a little, clip of Gwendolyn Christie, but not in the movie Star Wars because they didn't have anything at the time. I just did an interview, um, you know, sitting at a interview and I was like, okay, I've got her voice. But so I was very nervous because I had to do an homage to her. It, It seriously had to be that people didn't know the difference because in a Star Wars resistance, she didn't do her second season. She did her first season. So it had to be seamless. And she's a brilliant actress. I mean, I was a huge fan mm-hmm. in Game of Thrones. She's taller than me, and I'm very tall, so I loved her even more. And, um, <laughs> you know, she's just so, such an amazingly powerful woman. And uh, so how it was it different is that I had to have the exact sound and tone of her voice, but also do her incredible acting and performance and sync it to these little Lego characters, even though that's not so bad because their mouths don't really enunciate because they're Lego <laughs> pieces. <laughs> and even in the, it, but in the Star Wars resistance, it was more, it was even more finessed in terms of her performance, because we were dealing with a lot of Star Wars, actual cast members from the original movie, may some of them rest in peace now. Um, and uh, yeah. so truly I wanted to honor her incredible performance. How difficult is it then to, to take on, 
the voice of someone who, who it, you know, it's not an, an original character. You can't kind of play around with it and make it your own. How fine is that line between imitation and impersonation? That's a fantastic question. And actually, it's got to be the same tone and without mimicking, because if you sound like a robot, sometimes when you're trying to mimic somebody, it's like a comedian and that's not going to work. So you have to get into the finessing and the different intricacies of her character. And like any piece, I still have to know what she wants, what she wants in the scene, who she's relating to, who she's talking to. But yes, I have to do the same tone as her, which is tricky and still make a performance out of it without sounding like I'm mimicking her. So it really can't be a mimic. It's a fine line because you're an, you're an actor. I'm not an impersonator, even if I am technically taking on her voice. See, I'm mm -hmm. not using the word impersonation because it won't be human. Well, speaking on, on the acting front, I actually want to cover a bit of your journey here and, and take you back a bit. As your beginning started out very different, Mm -hmm. uh, your move into the arts was through ballet initially and then moving on to theatre. So as a Canadian, what were your earliest influences? What made you open your eyes to pursuing this career you're now on? Well, I have to tell you, I did not want to be an actor. I didn't grow up wanting to be an actor. I wanted to be a ballet dancer. And the reason why I started my acting career, you're going to laugh, is because of flat feet and bad posture. So... <laughs> My mother and father took me to ballet classes because, and I was really shy, so I'm making up for lost time now, believe me, guys. <laughs> and I was like really shy and nerdy and, and just skinny little bean pull of a kid. And I, my feet wouldn't, they didn't have any arches. So my parents put me into ballet and it's there where I fell in love with the stage because at the end of each year, we'd have a, a recital. And my ballet teacher would say to me, she was kind of mean, but in the end, it kind of worked out. She said, you're never going to be a great technical dancer. Oh, I, wait, I have to do it. You're never going to be technical dancer. You're going to be actress. No, I don't want to be an actress. I want to be a ballet dancer. So you like that acting? There you are. Was that Clarice <laughs> Leishman? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love her. I love her. Yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah. I'm going to have to do it with a German accent with the with a, a young Frankenstein. She's so Blucher. Good. Yeah. Frank Blucher. <laughs> that's great. Oh, God, I love that movie. My dad's favorite. Anyway, so she would say you're going to be actress because when you do the dying swan, you always do extra arm wave. And if you're a comedy ballet, you make people laugh. So I seem to have a knack for being on stage and waiting for audiences, even though you don't speak in ballet. And I just love live theater. To me, that's where I felt uh, more confident. And my feet did get better. I actually ended up having very high arches and my posture was much better and I related to kids better. So ballet helped me in that regard, but I fell in love, much to my parents' chagrin, <laughs> with the theater and acting. And um, I think the acting came because my my body could not hold out very well. I was long and lanky and i grew like six inches in one year and my knees just couldn't take it just yeah yeah it's it it made me cry it was one of the worst years of my life that transition you know everybody has some monumental moments in their life and that was one of them where i had to decide what the hell i was going to do with my life you know at 19 <laughs> you know <laughs> so that that was that was ballet. I think really formed who I am as a performer. Truly. Well, you've become um, an iconic cult figure in the sci-fi world. You know, mainly down to landing a range of bizarre and fascinating roles that we we're going to get into in a bit. Um, but before all of this, did you take a traditional route of acting in TV commercials and uh, extra work in Canadian productions prior to your first documented acting gig with the series? Check it out. God, is that on my IMDb? Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. With, Don, with Don Adams from Get Smart. Um, that was, actually, he's a huge, um, he had a huge fan base. Yeah, that was fun. Um, what did you ask me? <laughs> <laughs> no, just, just, ask, just asking about, you know, what kind of route did you go into uh, before uh, you well, actually started performing? Was it through commercials, extra work? No. It wasn't because of after I got a big injury, I ended up going back to school 
And in school, so the acting wasn't really what I wanted to do. And in school, one of the credits was um, like a stage course, even though I was taking, I was taking English literature and I went to university or college and I went to a school that had, you know, languages and I took French and I took a theater program and I took Greek mythology and I just took a bunch of general arts programs. And then there was a course mm -hmm. there. I thought, oh, this will be an easy credit where you had to do a couple of plays a year in a sort of a playhouse. And so I did uh, plays there, but at the time it was just, you know, freebies. It wasn't commercials or anything like that. And then one day somebody had posted an ad for a dinner theater to do a production of this crazy play called The Drunkard. It was um, a musical melodrama and I made $50 a week and it was a dinner theater. So you would serve food, do the show, at intermission, serve the people again, finish the show, and then collect the bill. It was called paying your dues. And, oh, it was really difficult, but fun. And some of my dearest friends, I'm still friends with, that was my technically my first stage show. And then after that, I, I got an agent was in the audience, actually, who came to see one of her other clients, and she uh, took me on. And then I started doing some commercials, no extra work. A um, couple of commercials, but I, I always had a hard time with those because if you if you were going in and you had to sort of pretend to rub lotion on your hands and be serious, I always took it to a comedic <laughs> level. Like I'd go, oh, this lotion. Oh, wow, 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 wow. That feels good. Like do stupid things because I wasn't comfortable doing serious stuff at the time because I was not that comfortable with myself. So I would make everything funny. So I started to get known as as sort of comedic kind of stuff and, um, or dancing. Like my ballet came in handy. I did a lot of beer commercials, guys, where there would be a lot of dancers and I'd be the head girl dancing and dirty dancing, a lot of dirty dancing with the beer. I'm sure you guys understand that. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think yeah. I can picture it. Yeah. Yeah. You can picture it. Yeah. And, uh, that, you know, that's where it went. It was fun. <laughs> my first recollection of you, uh, you, you played a, a small role in, I think it was a Jesse Ventura movie called Abraxas. Oh, my <laughs> God. God you know, you know, uh, just to set the stage here, it's a Canadian sci-fi movie, very like the Terminator as much as I remember it. And I remember that movie coming out mainly because the box oh. art said, James Belushi is in this movie and he's in it for like one minute. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Wow. Okay, yeah. So there's a Braxis, um, and then shortly afterwards, uh, you had a role in a Judge Reinhold movie called Baby on Board. You know, I don't know what that's doing on my credits. I don't think I'm in that movie. <laughs> really? I don't know. I, You know what? I think I had, oh, yeah. I was a, a lingerie saleswoman in it, but I think I got cut out. I, You know what? I've never seen it. We'll have to rent that and have a good laugh. Definitely. Well, so glad you, around this point, you're obviously moving into more and more movies that are not TV movies, which you were also doing around that yeah. time. Yeah. So how was the change for you from smaller productions to the bigger movie roles at this time? You know what? I was very lucky, guys. I was juggling everything at once. In Canada, to make a living, you have to be able to do stage, film, television, industrials, um, uh, commercials, everything, because there's just not enough work. So a, a lot of my stuff, I was still doing stage at the time. I did mostly stage. And then in between, I would do these little movies or movies of the week. And that's before I moved to LA. Most of my work was still, I think, on the stage. I haven't been back to this early period in my life for a while. So you're getting me memories. Like <laughs> we said oh we were going to take you on a ride. Oh, you're taking me on a ride, a magic carpet ride. So it's, um, I, th I was very lucky to juggle a lot of things at once. And I kept, what I kept doing was striving to learn more. Like I took improv to make my comedy better. I just, I took singing. I did a lot of musical theater. That's how I, after ballet, I started to do musicals because I thought, okay, I can dance. I better take tap. I better take jazz. I better take singing. And so I was kind of a triple threat at the time, but I didn't really know how to act. So I was taking acting lessons too, because if as a stage show, you have to be able to do the same show every, you know, seven, eight shows a week. And I was going, I'm having trouble crying in this scene tonight. I don't know how to do it. 
So that's when I started taking acting classes and then movies and small movies and then bigger movies followed after that, for sure. Speaking of which, Steve. Yes. It's 1994. Uh Uh-oh. Suddenly, we're introduced. Oh, God. (laughs) Oh, God. Where are we going? We're introduced to the... Oh, God. I can't even get this out. (laughs) The fabulously schlocky horror movie, Tammy and the T-Rex. Oh, that was my first big movie in (laughs) L.A. I loved it. Oh, God. Which, you know, you've got two future stars in there with Paul Walker. And uh, Denise Richards and Paul Walker's uh, high school brain gets transferred into the body of a, I, I think he's, a, I can't remember, I think he's an animatronic Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yes, he's a dinosaur, yep. <laughs> <laughs> you took the role of Helga and this uh-huh. movie is, it's become legendary in a so bad it's good cinema style yeah, it's the worst best movie or the best worst movie ever made and guys it's got a huge resurgence this past year and a half it has years. yeah because they released it with the um because it, i think it was a, originally it was a horror film and then it became a comedy so um well no it's always been so bad at the comedy but it, <laughs> it, it's and actually it was a com- if you you two must watch this movie because you've I've never seen, seen anything like it in your life uh no it was always a horror comedy but yeah. um what they did release was a more violent version where the gore was literally seeping out of people's pores <laughs> and ears and brains and it's so gross that i mean i haven't seen it from start to finish but i've seen scenes from it and i'm like whoa it's so good and juicy <laughs> yeah Oh yeah, well, it's... how did this? How did this fabulous piece of of monster <laughs> schlock land in your lap? How did you end up uh, getting the role? Well, this is a very interesting thing. At the time, I had a manager and uh, in L.A. and he sent me to an audition. And at the time, I was very I was in my twenties, but the part said tall Germanic blonde like Louise Fletcher in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and I'm like, well. I'm tall, but I'm not in my 40s. I'm not Germanic, but he said, just go. You're funny, just go. And I did the wildest audition I think I've ever done in my life. There was a boardroom, and I'll never forget this. This is a good story, guys. So (laughs) it's a boardroom, and they're all sitting around the boardroom. And all I had was a script that said something like scalpel, pass the scissors, pass the whatever you use for, you know, uh, let's cut into the brain. Let's do this. Let's do that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Whatever. Here's a scalpel. That was it. Like seven lines of that. So I, in the middle of the night, I had an epiphany. I said, I am going to make her a necrophiliac. I'm going to make her obsessed <laughs> with everything oral, put everything. Well, this is not going to come out right, but I'll make this sort of polite. Uh, everything that you could put in your mouth. I, I, I like from a cigarette. Let's get move, move on from this topic. Do scalpel to everything. <laughs> and I was always eating strawberries. I was eating a bunch of things in the movie. And uh, so, in the audition, I crawled up on the table. I had a raincoat because I remember it was raining, which is very unusual in LA. And I put the raincoat there. That was later. I found out, you know, to be Paul Walker. And that was the place I was operating. And I literally straddled the raincoat. And had, I think, a pencil to use as a scalpel, and I was licking it and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And just their mouths were hanging because everybody was going, the scalpel. And I thought, I'm going to make her over sex, just crazy, wild woman. And at the end of it, they went, we have other women to see, but you've got the part. (laughs) (laughs) Because nobody would think to do that and i didn't look like anybody there you know i was dark hair very dark haired at the time and just you know sometimes the square peg doesn't fit into the round hole and sometimes after seeing so many women they just was a breath of fresh air and it just i thought i'm taking this crazy risk and it worked and i got to work with the incredible terry geyser who is one of the best highlights of my comedic life and working with him because he's you know from weekend at bernie's he's a brilliant farcer yeah. He's yeah. such a great comic actor. And I met one of my dearest friends at the time. At, you know, Denise Richards and I hung around for about four or five years after that. And Paul was, oh, Paul was a doll. And just, it was all of our first movie. We were so excited. And another star came out of that movie. And you had to really look hard. But he played a small part of a pizza boy 
who delivers the pizza to the dinosaur's lair and then runs away. And that was Ephraim Ramirez, who played Pedro in Napoleon Dynamite. Oh, oh snap! Oh, snap, oh. snap, snap. And then when we got, when I got to the set flash forward later to Napoleon Dynamite, he looked at me and I looked at him and I, I said, Tammy. And he says, oh, God. And we were laughing so hard. So, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Small world. So that's how it I got is. it out of a crazy audition. It's an incredible film. It, it really is. is. It's, it's <laughs> one of those films that you... You'll never forget, right? No, no, oh, yeah. and it's one that I think you do actually have to watch, especially with friends, after a few shots of Jack Daniels, especially, and you just, <laughs> yeah. just go nuts. It's a remarkable movie. It's, it's, it's you can't describe it till you. And what about with those outfits I was wearing? Oh, oh my god, god. <laughs> those well, were hot. Yeah, <laughs> rumor has it the production went ahead purely because uh, the director Stuart Raffle he actually had access to the fully animatronic dinosaur for two weeks only. That's right. So the movie was quickly shot in locations about 25 minutes around his house. Right. <laughs> this had That's to be true. the craziest shoot you had to work on. But uh, there must have been well, some the funny stories arrested. around it. Well, the guy was arrested. The producer went to jail, so really? it never saw the light of day. And I think it had <laughs> one screening, and then the producer went to jail, and now this other new guy... Uh, acquired the rights. I'm not sure of the details, but this is 20 something years later. I mean, it's it is crazy. You can't make this up. <laughs> well, what were, what were some of the um, some of the craziest times working on that movie? We, we must have some stories. That we've, it's being such a, a small budget and you know shot in the way it was. There must have been some instances where yeah, some proper gorilla moments. Yeah, gorilla moments. Well, the biggest gorilla moment was there was a huge fire going on in um, Calabasas at the time. And we were told to evacuate, evacuate, evacuate. All these policemen came and fire chiefs and firefighters. But no, Stuart Raffle had to get the shot. And the fire, <laughs> if you can, you'll see the movie, watch it again. When Denise rides the dinosaur, you can see an orange sky. And literally, we could start to feel the burn on our faces. Oh, yeah. Wow. And that's actually dangerous to inhale that. But no, all of us idiots had to stay and get the shot. So I would say that that's a freaking frightening, awful situation. But we loved it anyway. <laughs> and the other one, part two, and this I'll never forget because when I went and saw a screening of it, there's a part where at the end something happens to Terry Kaiser where the stuff spews all over my body, his entrails, basically. Mm. And I run and I scream. Well, in one take, my skirt, <laughs> you better go back and look, guys. You can see my bum bum. Uh, my, skirt, <laughs> my skirt flew up and I pulled it down and I looked at the guy. I said, you're not going to use that take, are you? And he looked at me and I said, oh, you're going to use that take, aren't you? He said, it's so funny. And I, it really was funny. It's very funny. So uh, anyway, that's the other thing that happened that I can remember like, they're going to use this take because it's me struggling in these high heels with this little black leather mini skirt pulling it down and it's it and you know what i'm it's i think it's hilarious and, and i'm you know I'm, I'm not into gratuitous stuff like that but it was perfect gratuitous stuff <laughs> it was perfect well like john ashton was saying the other week uh, there there is there is only so much of a certain thing that you can get away with and it sounds like that was just perfectly just it was it was sometimes mistakes are the best in movies they really make turn out no, to be fabulous true. moments yeah. it's true even after that, you're steadily working through the 90s on a number of cult shows, uh, including voice work for the anime Sailor Moon, uh, appearances in the cult vampire cop show Forever Night. Oh, um, I love that. Um, yeah. By this point, you're starting to gain a cult following whilst being majorly situated in Canada. Now, did you start to catch on around about this time of your growing popularity? No. You know, at the time, I just did my work... I, I think when you come from the stage, you're, and especially I was just before that generation of selfies and Facebook and stuff like that. So I wasn't recording every move I made or every movie I made. And it wasn't until I got a PR person who said, start taking pictures of these moves. Because I didn't take anything on Tammy the T-Rex, which I'm, I took a pol you know, Polaroid. That's how old we all are. Remember mm. Polaroids, guys? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at the time, I really, I was just doing my work. I had no clue about the, I didn't, guys, I didn't even like sci-fi. 
I reluctantly went to the Lex audition and I just did not want to go. I said, what is this? I don't get this kind of material at all. I'm a stage actor. What is this garbage? You know, <laughs> you are you are the female Nimoy. Yeah. Oh, God, that was, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you didn't like his uh, sci-fi either. Well, that's true. I just read that recently. I had no clue, and God, he was good at it. So, yeah. no, I never. I didn't think about fame. I didn't think about fortune. I just thought about my work always. Well, we're going to have some people there suddenly going forever night. I remember that show. <laughs> I remember that show so well. I used to watch it every night. It was, it, was uh, a, it was a forerunner to a lot of shows, you know, with, when you think about True Blood and all the vampire shows. This mm. was one of the first. Uh, that one was censored. My episode was censored because I played a dominatrix. Oh, another crazy, wacky part. <laughs> I played a lot of wacky parts in the beginning. Um, and... See, that Tammy and the T-Rex thing worked out for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Forever Night was first, though, because I hadn't moved to L.A. at the time. But, yeah, uh, maybe the Forever Night made that decision now it was very it was too separate but um yeah i remember wearing this rubber dress and uh this very tight latex dress and i was sort of humiliating you know dominatrixes are very interesting i did a lot of research on that because i've always been a researcher so I'm i've done a lot of research as well but it's uh, it sure usually you cost you money yeah, yeah. <laughs> mine cost me nothing and that's a whole other topic we'll get into that your psychology of that <laughs> so, and uh so i talked to this lady and she said you know dominatrixes never have sex we never ever have sex we don't kiss we don't touch we just sort of humiliate i said oh okay that's interesting so i remembered literally just standing over this guy and humiliating him in the scene and it was apparently so powerful and so well done that cbs was very uncomfortable with it there was no nudity there was no touching no sex no drugs no rock and roll and they were so intimidated by it they they censored the scene and actually this did outside shots of the building and now and then would flash come back to my face that's that's how scared they were of that scene isn't that weird <laughs> it's a very famous weird. episode though very famous for that i know it's kind of bizarre it seems to be very prudish it yes. is yeah it is, it is. At the time yeah well, I actually caught another Ellen Dubin appearance just last year on a show that I never realised you had a part in. I started rewatching Do South last year because it's oh, one of my favourite shows that. of all time. Right, I, I worshipped this show when it was on. So it was one of my all-time favourite shows. I was amazed I never picked up on the fact that you were in it, as our guests always seem to have a David Marciano story like Tommy Hinckley did. So how was... Uh, how was Due South for you? One of the most popular shows on TV at the time. Very popular show and very popular in Canada. And, you know, everybody wanted to do it because Paul Gross, who was a very well-known stage actor, and then he became Constable Fraser. I remember the name of the character. Everybody wanted to work with him. The girls all had crushes on him. He's a very handsome man. Mm. And I just loved the show. And David, it's funny, I ended up doing a reading of a, a play that he wrote in L.A. Flash forward several years later, we... He remembered me from that show. Um, I don't remember too much. I just remember that I was in a courtroom and I was very nervous because I had to be, I think I was a young lawyer and yes. I was nervous about that because even though you're an actor and you're in front of people, a lawyer, you're even in front of more people, sort of a double whammy because you're going on or in the court. In my court, this, that, 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 and you're sort of doing it sort of like an audience within an audience. So I was very scared about it and I wanted to be authentic. And I remember studying lawyers on TV before I went in. Um, I had a blast. It was such a fun show. And Ken Welsh, who I think he was the bad guy in it, who's a wonderful Canadian actor who I admire so much. You know, I had a, I was crushing on him because of his talent. And so I had a really great episode. I had a really good time in that show. No, I that used cool. to really enjoy watching that. It, yeah, it's still they had great, great chemistry. Today. Yeah. I, I remember I actually got the uh, the soundtrack yeah, um, around about oh, wow. the time I've lost count. Then <laughs> I think actually the CD wore out at one point. I've now got it downloaded somewhere. I still have the CD of that. Yeah. As soon as I saw it in the store, I was like, having that straight away. And yes, all the songs from it are still on my Spotify playlist. Oh, I love it. Oh, God, yeah. Um, end of the 90s. And you're now firmly established as a go-to girl for sci-fi in Canada even if you didn't want to be. Um, you've <laughs> appeared in First Wave, Earth Final Conflict, and our favourite form of conversation, Highlander. In Highlander oh. the Raven. 
Loved it. So that's three iconic sci-fi series within a few years of each other. So yep. how would you best define your time and your roles in each one? Well, there were very different roles. And this is when I realized that sci-fi actually gave great opportunity for some real good meat for mm. actors. Um, and that's when I started to appreciate it because, you know, you could play a sort of over the top kind of villain or you could do sort of like law and order kind of acting and it still could be a sci-fi show. So First Wave was actually very important for me because that producer was watching because he later cast me in one of my favorite roles of The Collector. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, I played a woman who ran an old age home where the old people were turning into young people by drinking a magic elixir. I think that was the episode. And um, it starred one of my favorite actors, uh, Sebastian Spence, a wonderful Canadian actor who does a lot of stuff. I liked the part because it was just a very nice person, just a very sweet person. And then Earth Final Conflict was a very challenging part because I took the Talons hostage um, and I was a TV show producer and I had to learn all the jargon of Earth Final Conflict and I had a lot of monologues in that. Now they cut it and edited it out but I remember literally it was like three pages of dialogue and they were very happy that I had stage training because with stage training you can stand up there and deliver that kind of piece. Also to have Roddenberry on your resume Mm. And to oh, meet yeah. Gene Roddenberry's son, who I later bumped into several times at San Diego Comic-Con, and we always had a good catch-up and talked about his mom. And uh, so that's kind of neat. But then at the time, again, when I'm in it, I'm doing my work. I don't think, oh, I mean, yes, I thought, oh, I'm in a Roddenberry show. But the impact of how fans are receptive and so receptive to that kind of show is amazing. So you realize it kind of after the fact more. I mean, what was the third show you mentioned? Highlander. Highlander the Raven. Oh, hi well, mm. that one was, oh, I, I was in L.A. at the time and I, I booked the role and I studied with Errol Flynn's sword master, Bob Anderson, at a place it's in Burbank and it closed up. He was amazing. And then I came to Toronto and studied with Ray Pure Wit here so I could be authentic with a broadsword because I had a, the first broadsword fight in the history of Highlander. So that was, that's always my joke, broad to broad, <laughs> broadsword fight. And uh, so that was very challenging. And I loved the mythology of Highlander, learning about that. And I loved working with the female lead who we made, um, became friends after as well. She's such a wonderful person. And I just like, remember, there wasn't a lot of sci-fi shows were starting to get stronger women. And she, so I love that that was happening, you know, and admiring that. And I, yeah, I got to work with some really Elizabeth Grayson and Paul Johansson, such wonderful people, just a lot of really good people that I loved. It was neat. Well, funny enough, uh, speaking, obviously, uh, women taking a more prominent role in series. So not only are you racking up sci-fi roles, you are also in some of the most action-packed TV series as well, like Relic Hunter on Sky One. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is it still running? Oh no, 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 that 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 stopped its run a long time ago. But it's it, it just gets repeated all the time, and it's mm. funny now because you can catch it at like seven a.m. in the morning. Oh, we did. Very, that's what I figured. Yeah, she's <laughs> very weird. And uh, you're also in the uh, Robocop Prime Directives. That oh yeah, well. I like that. Yeah, I like that. That, that one still keys has a good following. Now and then I'll get maybe once or twice a month I'll get an email about that. People are really. Uh, fascinated with Robocop. Yeah, I enjoyed that. I played a hostage negotiator and uh, I always wanted to have one of those megaphones. Come out of the bank, everybody! <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was fun. <laughs> Megaphone acting. <laughs> well, all of this, you know, it leads you to the ultimate in cult status. You're then appearing in the, well, it's now, it's an iconic series, which is Lex. And you're not just one character in it. You're actually playing four different characters. A big shout out to Ralph Brown also, who had a role in that series as Duke, not the G.I. Oh. Joe character, Steve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Ralph Brown was on a couple of weeks ago. He's a really good friend, so I had to give him a shout. But Gigarota, and I believe I'm saying that right. Gigarota. Gigarota, okay. The Wicked. Okay, I'll read it. Don't forget that. The Wicked. <laughs> so, Full Gigarota. titles, please. Yes. Gigarota Le Wicked in France became <laughs> I, one of. I like it became one of the most cherished characters in the show and one that many Comic-Con fans remember you by. So 
How did this show suddenly gain such popularity from your vantage point? Remember, this is before social media. So just yeah. before, because Farscape right after us started to get a little bit more um, press from that. Um, and it was really the forerunner of many shows. I think people really appreciated the double entendres of the show. Paul Donovan, who created the show, had a sick, crazy, wacky, screwed up sense of humor and a sense of the absurd. So you could take it at face value for the storylines, but what he did was he made a commentary on politics and on love and and all the stuff going on in the world. And if somebody was, you know, had a more of a brain, they could see that he was making a comment on religion or whatever, like the fourth the fourth season when I played the first and only Pope in sci fi history. And he was making a comment on organized religion and I don't mean to offend anybody. I didn't write this, but it's kind of quite interesting. So an organized religion was golf for him, the yeah. obsession of golf. And so I literally would take the lead characters hostage mm. and play golf on their heads. And we shot it in Thailand in a beautiful temple in Thailand. Uh, uh, yeah, it was kind of sacrilegiously, oddly weird. But I think that fans started to identify with the crazy characters and Brian Downey, who played Stanley Tweedle's kind of an everyman character, an every bumbling, dumb, buffoon kind of character, which a lot of people can identify. And he got the sexy woman played by Ava Haberman in season one and then Xenia Seberg later on in the rest of the seasons. And uh, I think they loved all the antics. And all, I mean, this is a crazy show. It's sort of like Red Dwarf meets Doctor Who means mm. meets... You know, it's a different, there's a British yeah. sensibility to it, uh, guys, that um, I think Americans started to appreciate. It's really offbeat. It was on uh, the Sci-Fi Channel here in the UK is where yeah. I caught it. Uh, I think pretty much when it started, I believe, it, when it actually first was broadcast, I came across it and I was like, this is different. But I'm liking it. Yeah. It was always one of those things which I never got to see because um, I didn't have satellite TV or cable TV until fairly late in the day. But I do remember kind of hearing about it and thinking, oh, this sounds a little bit risque. Yeah, he, he went, he crossed the line. I don't know if we could still do the show now, but it was very topical, very, very clever. And it really, it set the tone for a lot of shows. Yeah. You know, and and sci-fi was having that big kind of resurgence. It felt like a new sci-fi show was debuting every week yep. <laughs> you know, at the time, and it was really hard to keep up. And I think, you know, to get four seasons out of it, that's pretty impressive for a show like that. And remember, they started as Movies of the Week, and we had Rutger Hauer and Barry Bostwick, who I got to work with, and Tim Curry and Malcolm McDowell. I mean, whew, yeah, very yeah. heavyweights. Moving away from sci-fi, um, because if we don't, I'm going to bring up Firefly and I'm going to get upset. Um, uh, uh, I wanted to be on that show. I, like that show. I know. Oh. Uh, well, suddenly you're launched into the hearts of everyone in the classic Napoleon Dynamite where you're playing the part of Lien. Now, you'd never actually done explicit comedy to this extent before. I mean, you you touched on things such as uh, in Tammy and the T-Rex, but this was actual proper comedy going in. So did you expect it to get as big as it did? No, no. You could imagine that a, a movie that I shot in Preston, Idaho, uh, with an unknown named John Heater, directed by Jared Hess, and no major stars in it, nobody was a star, would become i like stories like this though it's the little engine that could yeah uh and we didn't need an a-list movie star for a movie that ended up at sundance and became the audience favorite and it just it's become the iconic comedy of a generation that's how big it is and people still quote it i get an email practically every day about it and people can quote every single phrase in that movie it's amazing no i'm stunned and it kind of started this real movement where you'd see these movies kind of like Juno and yes. uh, Rocket Science, which is two films that Steve's had to watch recently from mm. What's in the Box. And, and it's very much in that same vein. It almost kind of started this really quirky comedy style that is still going strong today. I don't think I ever remember any movie quite like it beforehand. No, and I think that it really set, a, you're right, a different kind of tone, but it also, people really identified again with the nerd there's i think everybody 
if they're a normal person, this is going to sound weird, air has a nerd in them. If you're not a nerd or you don't have a quirky bone in your body, then you're not normal. I'm going the other way. <laughs> <laughs> I think a nerd is fantastic. We are all quirky characters in life. There's no black and white in terms of, you know, we're good or bad or whatever, or dancing in moon boots at the end of a movie. Uh, I think so many people identified with it and they'd never seen characters like that. And John, I mean, I still remember the first time I was standing behind that door to open the door in that first take. I had to, I think my tongue bled. I had to bite my tongue. And if you know me really well, you'll see there's a smirk in my lips <laughs> yeah. because it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life when I opened the door to see him standing there. I had not seen him beforehand. I didn't see the hair and the teeth and the outfit and the, and the way he talked and his body language. So you can imagine to see that for the first time. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. He's, he's a wonderful actor in that. He's so not like that. So when you're at Comic Cons or anything, are fans bringing you Tupperware? <laughs> you know what? Nobody has done that. They've asked me if I've collected it, but that's a good idea, guys. They yeah. should. Yeah. Sign my Tupperware. I like that. Because <laughs> yeah. you've seen Napoleon Dynamite, haven't you, Steve? I haven't actually, no. Uh, you're the one. I'm the one. The one person that could have made that an all-time great classic. Yeah, we needed your <laughs> we needed your audience. Vote. <laughs> I know I'm I'm a big letdown, particularly to no. Andy. Well, well, <laughs> well, Ellen's character is she's basically a, a I'd say obsessed with Tupperware. Would you say? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And Uncle Rico likes to sell Tupperware, and he's very <laughs> yes. charming. And when he sells it, oh, I love John Grease. What a great actor he was. I was very fortunate to work with him. He's an amazing actor who played yeah. Uncle Rico. Wasn't he funny? He is hilarious. The, the entire film service, and everyone you know, remembers the John Heater's dance to Jamiroquai's oh. Canned Heat, which is what really made the movie. You know, that, that's the scene everyone can remember from it. But every character in this film was just so hilariously laced. I, I've got to watch that movie again. I remember when, uh, w when we first got together in L.A. Yeah. at Jerry's, was it? was Jerry's, wasn't it? Yeah, Jerry's it? Deli, yeah. Jerry's Deli. <laughs> Rest in peace, Jerry's Deli. Aww. We got there, and I we got the picture of the two of us, and I pushed it up, and loads of people put up, Napoleon Dynamite! <laughs> so they knew straight away. <laughs> it was crazy. I know. I think they have them in their pockets. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to me like it's... I, obviously, I haven't actually seen it, so yes. this is We're now into... It's in the box. Um, it's in the box. This is into Goonies territory, um, but it <laughs> oh. but it does seem to be kind of like the first time really that the nerd the geek was kind of embracing the fact that they were a nerd and a geek. It wasn't being hid or mm -mm. kind of seen in a negative light. And yeah, like you say, with other movies going forward like Juno and Rocket Science, that thing seems to be just embraced, and I think it kind of opened up a whole new world for a lot of uh, a lot of very talented people. Definitely. You know what? There was no apologies about the characters and their flaws. And I like that about a movie. And, you know, it wasn't pat. It wasn't predictable. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, I mean, from here, you go on to a show you've you've already mentioned. I know we, we skip out a hell of a lot of stuff that you have done. And I do apologize. It saves it for you to come back another time, yes. I guess. But you move on to The Collector. Mm. Uh which was an amazing series. I loved this show. I know Steve's probably never heard of it, so I'll let you tell him about it. Another brilliant show that really needs to be seen by more people. I would really would hope that it would come out again. It's about a man who collects souls for the devil, played by Chris Kramer. And the devil is played by a different actor every week because the devil can come in many forms. It can be a a busker at a subway station. It could be a nine-year-old little girl. It can be a saleswoman at a store. It could be a doctor. It could be a nurse, a farmer. Um, it was a very interesting show. And I played one of the leads. I was a reporter who was always on the story trying to find out Chris's character. Something was suspicious. Like, why is he always running? And where is he going? And does he have ties to the devil? And I have a little boy. I'm a single mother. And he may be the son of the devil. I don't know that, but I knew, know that as Ellen, but not as my character. So it was a fantastic show. Very 
uh, I got nominated for Best Actress in a Series that year because it ran the gamut. Again, this was not a sci-fi show. It's called a supernatural drama more, but it was not an over-the-top thing. It's more like, you know, procedural acting. And it was probably one of my favorite jobs to be on a series like that. It was, the storylines were great. Allie Matheson, who's Richard Matheson's daughter, famous Twilight Zone writer, and um, John Cooksey produced the show, and Larry Sugar, who produced First Wave, Larry Sugar. So he remembered mm. me from that. So anybody who wants to be an actor and is listening, always do a good job because you never know who's watching or who's listening five years from now or, you know, 10 years from now, somebody say, I remember her in this and they could hire you. So that's how that came about. I loved it. It was one of my favorite jobs. While you were talking then, I actually just looked it up on IMDb because your description of it was ringing bells in the back of my head. And it's one of those where it, it, the plots sounded so familiar. I can't honestly remember if I have watched it or not. Um, mainly because I've been drunk since. Um, but, <laughs> but this does sound so familiar to me. There was an episode about a drunk who does a deal with the devil. Every episode is about somebody who does a deal with the devil mm. and the consequences. So you can get 10 years of free booze and be rich and have wine, women, and song. But then at the 10th hour, the last hour, whatever they call it, the 11th hour, that's what they call it, the devil comes to collect. And that's basically what the premise of the show is, I should add that, That's because that's interesting. What people will do to do a deal with the devil. Will they run? Will they try and seduce him? Will they try and work with him? And uh, it's a wonderful plot point. There's many plots to it. So you may have seen it. You may have. Mm. Yeah, yeah you, you should see the episode that was set on my wedding day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I'm not touching that one. We're moving on. Yeah, that's that. what it was called. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. That was the name of the episode. <laughs> Oh, God, that's funny. <laughs> Do you see what I've got to work with here? Oh. Okay, so you move from TV, you've moved into film, uh, but you're also, at the same time, moving into video game voice work. Mm -hmm. Looking through your IMDb, there is just a string of fantastic games, and this is my area of expertise over here. Um, and we brought up a number of them in the start of the show, and there are some big hitters there. Lots of fantasy, including one of my favourites, Skyrim, mm -hmm. uh, Fallout 4. I played that to death. I still like that one, even though people prefer the others, but that's by the by. So... <laughs> How did you actually get the start doing voice work? Well, that's a good question. So I was in Los Angeles in my commercial agency, and I was talking to my commercial agent, and she's right next door to a voice agent. And she said, you know, you really should do voice. You have such an interesting voice. And she said, I'm going to walk your stuff over there. And they happen to have the time. And they're called Vox, V-O-X, Inc. And I'm still with them. Uh, amazing agency. And we had a great interview and they took me on the spot and they sent me uh, an audition for something called Guild Wars 2. <laughs> that was my first video game audition and I booked it. And this was a weird thing. I was in Arizona on a Christmas trip with my family and I just had a tiny little travel mic. And I had the the house that we rented was a had a very high ceilings, which is, excuse me, as you guys know, as sound people, not good. No. So I took a blanket, made a tent, lay on my belly and did 14 auditions. I think there was 15 characters and booked it lying on my belly. So you know what, guys, if there's a will, there's a way. And um, then I went and I, I got a call back and then that was my first one. And I started to love video games because the parts have great story arcs and the women's parts were better than television and film. And then I did Skyrim and then I did Elder Scrolls Online and I ended up playing a lot of orcs and Ar mm. Ar Argonians and all that kind of stuff. I'm sure you know that was those characters yeah. really well, Steve. <laughs> and a lot of characters where I started to have to really protect my voice because when you have a low voice like I do, you, start, you get a lot of the gruff, you know, gravelly ladies that are kind of either blue collar or else I go very eloquent and very Kate Blanchett and do a lot of those kind of fantasy ladies. So 
It's very interesting to be able to do voice. It's my favorite genre right now because I can be three, 300. I can be a queen. I can be a lizard. You know, I could be uh, somebody in a post-apocalyptic world, you know, a scavenger. I could be a soldier. It's just, I think the, the possibilities are endless because you don't see how somebody looks. It's my favorite. I, the, you doing a couple of those voices that reminded me, yeah, the, the Argonian. So I'm guessing you also did some of the ghouls in uh, Fallout 4. No, I actually didn't. I was a no. regular person in that. And it was very odd. I got cast in the Institute. I played uh, two scientists, uh, Ali Fillmore and somebody Secord, Alana Secord. And that was so weird because I had a scene. Here's a bit of trivia for you where I actually talked to myself in the scene. The two scientists were talking. And I thought, how am I going to make this different? Because with these kind of characters, you talk in your own voice. So I chose to make one that was completely new and green and excited. And then the other one was kind of like been around the block and had some cigarettes and a lot of whiskey and just, you know, was not really happy to be there because it's... Even the, even the director, he just went, oh, God, we're in the same scene with the same character out of thousands of characters. But it worked out very well, and nobody cared, and nobody knew, and I loved working. I love video games. It's my passion. The one thing about video games which differentiates itself from, say, animation or uh, any kind of traditional acting styles is that particularly if you do have something like the Elder Scrolls or Fallout, the player can interact in so many different ways. How difficult is it to try and keep the performances fresh when knowing, okay, they may not even hear this that's going on. A player may just completely ignore it. You know, Steve, I had no clue what the technological aspects were of video games. But in the studio, when you do the actual job, the director will say, okay, sometimes it's on a music stand and sometimes it's on a teleprompter. Later on, it starts to get more on a teleprompter as technology kind of evolved in st different studios. They're just going, okay, say line 129. Okay, so this is your brother. Okay, now this is your lover. And sometimes you'll say, I I'll make this up. I love you, Henry. I love you, John. I love you, Sam. I love you, Stan. Like in, I think Skyrim, I had like 10 husbands, depending on which the player mm. picked. And I, at first I didn't understand because I hadn't played video games at the time. The director says, oh, this is who the player chooses. So we're just going through and, and literally, okay, this is your aunt. This is your uncle. This is, your, uh, he's at the guillotine. So you're crying. Uh, you're serving beer in merry old England. You're a cockney wench. I mean, literally, sometimes you wouldn't even be in the same scene. So you'd be jumping from comedy to drama to, yeah, I carried it like this. Or and or then you'd be sort of like this or whatever. And you've got to be a great actor to do video games. You have to have it all there. There's no time to teach people how to act or cold read. So I always said, I teach actually video game acting right now. That's one of the things I'm doing sideline wise. And I keep telling people it's not about the sound of your voice, it's about your acting choices because games are very sophisticated now. And if there's a bad actor, it's people are not going, oh, hello, forsooth me. You know, it's very <laughs> cinematic and very talking to somebody. And it's like the camera was on you and you're doing like a scene from The Walking Dead hmm. or whatever. So when you're in it, you're just doing various versions. You're also doing various intensities because remember, Steve, we don't work with another actor. So I don't know how the king is going to respond to my line. I may go um, bow down and he'll go no way or whatever. I have to do bow down, bow down, bow down. So you do small, medium, large. So they have that to put into the game because they don't know how the other actor is going to respond or the director can know every thousands of pages. He won't know if the scene is loud or soft or there's an airplane going. So we have to cover a lot of bases that we sometimes don't even know all of the circumstances. Uh, it's very interesting work. Mm. You know, you're creating a lot of things with just your voice, the whole world. There's no costumes. There's no set. Um, there's no other actor to react against, but you have to pretend. And the director sometimes will phone the creator like a Bethesda on the phone and go, okay, who is George? Oh, not her brother. Oh, it's her lover. Oh, okay. You know, or, or we need to re-record that one. <laughs> oh, we got to do this again. Or oh, it's on a farm, not in a bar. Or oh, so you know, 
And you don't usually get a diagram, very rarely. So they're very helpful when somebody who's worked on a game, you have to remember how much work these people have done. Mm. You really appreciate what they've done to this, to create these incredible worlds. So yeah, it's very interesting work. I love it. I love the challenge of doing a performance without getting the material till you get in the booth. Because talk about NDAs, they don't give the material out till you're in there. Wow. So, wow. Very secretive. So you have to be a great reader and a great actor. You have to yeah. do it fast. Fast and furious. I'm now going to install Skyrim Special Edition onto my <laughs> Xbox, and I'm just going to go through this just listening out for you. Oh, good. Oh. You can send me some clips. <laughs> oh, there's an Argonian. Oh, no, it's a male. Oh. <laughs> well, sometimes you won't be able to tell because I can go pretty damn low. So, Especially in Elder Scrolls Online, there was a lot of lizard people, so I did a lot of that kind of stuff. Well. Wow. In coming back around to the movies here, uh, a couple of years ago when I was coming out to LA, this was after I met you, and yes, I did have Cabri's chocolate eclairs in my bag, as I do every <laughs> single time I come to LA, just in case I meet up with you. But uh, I'm on the plane, and I'm scouting through for a movie to watch, and suddenly, halfway through the movie, uh -oh. I see a familiar face, and I'm watching the movie Midway, directed by Rennie oh. Harlan. Uh, Roland Emmerich, let's go back. Was it... Ro oh, sorry. Did I say Rennie Harlan? You said Rennie Harlan. Ah, oh, I don't know why. I said that. I Another know. tall guy. Yeah. Okay, I'll start from midway. And I see you in the movie Midway, directed by Roland Emmerich, who looks a lot like Rennie Harlan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's staying in now. That, 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 that'll confuse him. That'll confuse him. Oh my God. I, I was just <laughs> I was just so happy to see you because it was one of the most miserable flights coming over I think I'd ever had. I had no leg room or anything and they eventually ended up moving me to another part of the plane where uh, no other people were so it was, it was nice. So I'm there watching Midway and it's like oh my god she looks just like Ellen Dubin and then in the next shot I see that is Ellen Dubin and you get to work with Mark Ralston. Oh. It is it is Mark Ralston, right? It's, oh, I was just yeah. thinking about him right now as you were speaking about Mark Ralston. Uh, he's an incredible man. Um, one of my, he's been in two of my favorite movies, so Aliens and Shawshank Redemption, so you can't beat that, can you? You, you no. can't. The movie wasn't as well received as a lot of big movies are uh, to do with these kind of raids. I thought it was a really enjoyable film. Some of the battle scenes were absolutely epic in it. He's very good at that kind of stuff, um, Roland. He's, I think he's an expert at shooting huge scenes like that. Unfortunately, my scene ended up on the cutting room floor, so I was pretty cut out of the movie. But he wrote me a lovely note saying, nothing to do with my work. I just spent a lot of time on my battle scenes. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I loved watching Woody Harrelson and Mark Ralston do their scene together. And Woody is an incredibly gifted actor as well. He really is very versatile and he's a health crazy nut in a good way. He loves all green stuff and talks about yoga a lot. He, even the cream he puts on his hands and face is all green and special organic and no chemicals. I was like very intrigued. I was writing it all down. Um, but I was very happy to get that movie. And I'm going to be serious here for a minute because my father was a World War II veteran. And when I did this self tape for the audition at the end, you have to say your name and your height. And I thought, you know what, this part, it's okay. It's not the biggest part to audition for, but it's a big movie and I'd like to get it. So I told a story about my father during world war II. My father was a navigator in a two seater plane and he was stationed in the Shetland islands. I'm sure you guys know where that is North of yeah, Scotland. Uh -huh. And he was on leave in London. So my dad spent a lot of time in, in overseas. And so he was in a, a plane called the Bristol bow fighter very famous plane. Anyway, so I told a story about my father and I booked the movie and when I went into my hair and makeup and he was a very hands-on director in terms of making sure everything was very specific and the wardrobe and makeup was fantastic. And he said, you know, your story about your father really moved me. And I said, thank you. And I said, I spoke from my heart and it was my second world war movie in a row. I did a small movie right after that called Boundless, which is 11 minutes, a Canadian movie made on a dollar. So I went from like a $150 million movie to like 
a hundred dollar movie, but I, again, a passion project about female pilots during World War II. And I found it very interesting that because my father had just passed recently at the time of these movies and I was grieving, I was very close to him. And to do two in a row, I was like, and I'm not one of these very spiritual people, but I really became one after that because I was thinking about my dad. And first of all, guys, how many World War II movies are there are made? Not very many. Not so many two in days. a row. No. And then when the wardrobe came out for the second one, it was the exact replica of my dad's uniform during World War II because wow. he was wow. in the Royal Canadian Air Force, the RCAF. So literally, it was a man's jacket and they had to take it in for me. But it was in a museum here. There's an air museum just about 45 minutes outside of Toronto. And they got it in, in storage. So I don't know whose jacket I wore, but I felt treated it very holily, if that's a word. But anyway, so the Roland Emmerich movie really meant the world to me. And then this little short film about women pilots during World War II, which I hope gets made as a feature film or a series, because it's a brilliant, true story that no pe not too many people know about. Um, so it was very meaningful as a tribute to my father to do those movies. Yeah, can, can Boundless be seen anywhere? Not yet. It's in the film festival circuit right now, and it's won every single award out in every festival that it's entered. Uh, best director, best film, best writing. It's a really fascinating topic. Most people don't know about this, as I said, that there were actually women during World War II that flew planes. And the yeah. woman I played was the act Jackie Cochran was the fastest pilot in World War II. She broke the sound barrier. She was faster than most men. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah, it's kind of a hidden story. She was from Florida. She was American. And when I got this part, that was a whole other crazy story. We'll talk about that another time. But it was, it was very meaningful for me. Yeah, she pioneered women's aviation, and she was with the most prominent racing pilot of her generation. She broke the sound barrier in uh, in 1953 after the war. Well, tell your people on that passion project that I want to see that passion project. Yeah, for sure. Me too. The only other thing which uh, which uh, kind of sounds even remotely familiar was I think there were Russian pilots and they were called by the Germans the Nachthexen. Was like were the they night... women too? Yeah, yeah, they were. Oh yes, the night flyers. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, they were just yeah, given yeah. crappy planes because they just thought, oh, no, 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 it's women, let them do it. And they just went on, like, bombing runs and strafing runs and <laughs> flying incredibly low to the point that they were, the uh, the soldiers were saying, no, there's just, like, the whistle of a witch going overhead. So, wow. Yeah. And, I, and funnily enough, uh, just, I think it was only about two weeks ago, I was watching a movie, kind of semi-related, I guess. There was an old uh, Goldie Horn movie called Swing Shift. Oh yes, yes, yes. And this was a, yes, this was like a story about um, when all the men went to war. All of the women went to work making the airplanes for the U.S. Army that yes. flew in the war. And it was a very true story. And the only reason I fully remember it, but every single time that I think of Swing Shift now, is I think of that unfortunate shot that was left in that movie, where Ed Harris sits down in his towel and uh, you you actually see all of his junk. <laughs> oh wow! And I never heard that cut. little tidbit. Tidbit. Oh, oh that's a bad word. <laughs> <laughs> little. Um. I love Ed Harris as an actor, so I don't care about his timbits. <laughs> yeah. That's a Canadian his, version. <laughs> his timbits flashed, and it was like wow. I'm not sure that should be in a PG movie, but no, maybe wow, not. Weird. Maybe they didn't notice. I don't know. That's weird. <laughs> oh, they, they fully must have known on that. And, and now here we are. We're, we're back round. We're with the release of Dune, and Dune is like this huge movie now. Part two has just been greenlit. Uh, yes, we've just I found read that. out. Yep. And I straight away, as soon as I heard, I'm straight away thinking there's going to be an anime. Oh. There's going to be an anime <laughs> or a game <laughs> or a Maybe. series. Oh, and be a game Ellen for sure. must be there. <laughs> oh, can you imagine an MMO? Like something like Elder Scrolls Online, but mm. with Dune? Oh, oh, that would be. Amazing. Oh, I bet you. I bet you they're thinking ahead already. They I probably, actually, yeah. I, I think that that would be wise. Oh, massively yeah. multiplayer online game. Oh, that would be good. Get calling sure. your agent manager, Ellen. Tell them yeah. you want the first call. Yeah. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I have to mention here, um, I, I have to talk about your charity work because this is such a big part of who you are. I know that you help out at the Los Angeles Mission. 
yeah. uh, which is just incredible. I also hear that there is uh, something else that you've started doing, which is the Miss Wheelchair USA. Is that right? That's right. I got involved with that through a friend of mine who's a producer that I met at San Diego Comic-Con. He said, would you be interested in working with young women and actually all ages and whether they're married or single, that's the beauty of this Miss Wheelchair. It is a pageant, but it's just more than a pageant. It's like a, it provides like a platform for women of all ages and all sizes and shapes with different abilities, I call it, to exhibit their own kind of glamour, inform people about their life stories and their journeys. And so I'm a judge in it, but I also advise the women on how to present themselves. I've taught them, we've been teaching voice classes, a friend of mine on Zoom, and they're from all over the United States. And I'll tell you, they're much more able than all of us. It's very rewarding to do. And how, how long have you been at the uh, Los Angeles Mission now? You've been helping out for a number of oh, years. Oh, at least 15 years now, 15, wow. 18 years. Yeah. And every Christmas, and I mean, obviously this last couple of years not because of COVID, but every Christmas and every Thanksgiving, you stand in a line and you meet the wonderful people of uh, Los Angeles that come down and they get a free meal and we chat with them. And I get to meet some great people and hear their stories again a wide range of people you know people have a misconception about homeless people all of us can be homeless and it's not people that you think if people i just really get annoyed with how people treat the homeless too we don't even call them homeless we just call people who are searching you know yeah. <laughs> people are searching um and there's people from all over in terms of like Ses saturday night live cast and and newscasters from the local area of la and it just gives you a perspective it gives you a true perspective of what's really going on in the world you know you're getting down in the trenches is a good thing i think yeah definitely no yeah. it's it's very true and i think a, a huge thank you would go out to you for being the world's most influential ellen these days <laughs> uh, again you're you now nah, you're the influential people um, if I? you go in thinking yeah you're pretty good listen andrew i got high hopes for you so don't let me down no pressure and steve i got new high hopes for you uh listen if you, you don't go into these charity work thinking i'm doing charity work i truly just enjoy working with people and meeting people and uh it just sort of fell in my lap and now I'm really, I really enjoying it. I've always been, oh, going to get serious for a sec, guys. I've always been taught from an early age to help people, to look after others yeah. before looking after myself. And I think that's reflected in everything I do in my work and in my personal life. And I, I don't separate the fact that I'm an actor because a lot of actors, you have to be self-centered because we are the product, but I always try to help others first. And that's been my thing since day one in the business networking and advising people it's just part of my nature hmm. no it's very I'm, I'm i'm the same myself as you know i'm i am I a know. very people centric person i think you hit the nail right on the head there 100 percent. well <laughs> i guess we're at that point of the show steve yes well we've had some amazing conversation we've gone over a massive range of topics we just need to make sure that you've got your nominate five. Now's the time to nominate five. Nominate five? Yes, nominate five. Not three or four or six or nine. Now's the time to nominate five. You weren't expecting music, were you? Now's the time to nominate five. Okay, that was my <laughs> Disney voice. <laughs> I'm nominating five, darling. Okay, you know, baby. Sounds like Norman Desmond. <laughs> that sounds no better at 2 a.m. I will just put it that way. I love it. I thought that was hilarious. Oh, okay. Uh, nominate nothing five. Yet. What's nominate five, Steve? Uh, well, nominate five is the part of the show where we invite our guest, if we have one on, to nominate five of something that is well, very, very personal to them. Sometimes we look at the most favourite musical scores, the most favourite pieces of cinematography, whatever. This week, we decided to ask our guest, being the amazing Canadian that she is, to nominate her favourite five Canadian actors that she's worked with. Ooh. Okay, 
Well, I have to start with my favorite leading man of all times, who I worked with in The Collector and I work with in a pilot called Starfall, Andrew Jackson. He's a wonderful actor and he's a wonderful voice actor and he's tall, blonde, and he makes me look petite. Okay. (laughs) Was he classed as number one or number five? Uh, He's classed as everybody's number one, even though I'll give you five. How about that? Okay, so we're doing the, the countdown backwards. No, no particular order. <laughs> oh, this never goes well. It, we never get this countdown right any week going. And last week, bloody Bill Daly and Mark Marshall hijacked the bloody show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in no particular order, and we'll just put oh. numbers afterwards. We'll jumble them all up. Oh, God, I <laughs> don't <next>? know. <laughs> Does it have to be an actor? I was thinking of somebody that's in the entertainment business. Well, she is an actor, but she directed me in that World War II movie. Her name is Kate Campbell very lovely director has a great imagination and she's a wonderful actress and a singer too so i I enjoyed working with her and i think she's going places i think she's amazing and then i'm going to nominate somebody else that's um not an actor but she's i think my favorite female canadian director who i started working with on collector but she's directed a lot of television she's also working on batwoman right now as an executive producer her name is holly dale she you should get her on the show. She's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Okay. You'll have to put a word in for us. Yeah, she's she when she's when the show's finished, uh she's oh god, she's amazing. Now let me just think who the other one is. Because I can think of a million American people, but I like this better. And I'm not I'm trying to think of people that I've worked with. Okay, Elias Tufexis. Do you know him? The name rings a bell. He is the Andy Circus of Canada. He uh-huh. has done a million voiceovers and a million video games, and he is the mocap king in Assassin's Creed and all kinds of wonderful shows. He, oh, he was in the in the Expanse Ooh. and The Walking Dead and Call of Duty and, and Assassin's Creed. You look him up, Elias Tufexis. Amazing. So we got one down to one. Okay, I'm going to name this actor who I thought was amazing to work with, named Russell Ewan, Y-U-E-N. I did a pilot with him called The Time is Right. It's a sci-fi show. We're hoping that it sells, written by Garner Haynes. It's a Canadian show, and it's about time travel. And I, our scene together is magnificent, and he's a very fine Canadian actor named Russell Ewan. Wow. Okay. So everyone listening to the show, they're all going to check these people out on IMDb. And I guess they might even be available for roles. So you never know, all you filmmakers who listen to our show. But Ellen, um, what have you got going on now? What have you got due to come out very shortly? Give us some promotion. Well, other than Dune, which it just opened in theaters on, on the 22nd here. Yeah, uh, I heard something we, about it. We opened late, later than uh, Europe. Oh, there's so much stuff. I have about four video games coming out, and unfortunately, I cannot name them. Sorry, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can send us word when they are, and we will promote them. Well, definitely, yeah, because one or two are going to be really great, and I'm very excited about them. And The Time is Right is a sci-fi pilot that I shot recently about time travel, which I just mentioned. We're going back to do a a reading of Starfall, which was a pilot I shot, another sci-fi pilot that I shot in Reno, Nevada. And we're going in to revamp that. Uh, We're starting with that in mid-November. And I'm actually going to play a different role in that. And uh, that's with actually with Andrew Jackson, the guy I mentioned first. And it's going to be, hopefully come out in about a year. I'll keep you posted on that. So there's some new stuff coming out. Uh, a new um, video game that just came out. Do you know this one, Steve, called Disgaea? Uh, Something uh, of Destiny? I think it's Disgaea. Disgaea. Um, yes. I haven't actually played it, but it's um, JRPG, isn't it? it, it yeah. It's a Japanese one. I'm not a big fan of JRPGs. There's only at like a handful that I really get into because uh, I think a lot of them go way too long over it. But then again, that's 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 a review. That's that's me slipping into the game review. That's okay. Oh, this and another movies. one. This is movies. Astria, yeah, but games are kind of movie-like now. Yeah. Astria Ascending is coming out. I think it came out just recently at the end of September, beginning of October. I can say that one. 
It's uh, on Steam. Astria Ascending. It's another Japanese game, and this was from a, a company in France. And I played um, a goddess with magical powers. That was fun. I enjoyed that. Wow. So that's coming out now, too. So the rest, um, you'll have to wait. The NDA all the way. Yes, <laughs> it is the way to go. No, that is an amazing amount of stuff. It has been so fantastic to catch up with you after so long. And uh, it's been great to have you on the show also. And thank you for thinking of me, Andrew. And a great pleasure to meet you, Steve. And Andrew, we're going to make your movie. We're going to make one or two or three of them, at least. It's coming up. I have complete faith in you. I've always <laughs> believed in you. You're amazing. Oh, thank you. you I'll settle are. on one movie at the moment. You know, That's right. Know. But yes, um, I am looking forward to getting my movie off the ground, hopefully next year. It would be so great to have you there if you are available. And if we can make that happen, that would be awesome. Oh, we're going to make it happen. We just want to make you happen. We want to get you money and we want your... I mean, you've had some great people behind you, so I'm oh, really I've... wishing you the best. You deserve it. And people love your stuff. Yeah, ah, so strangely. Good writer. It's strangely. <laughs> well, we won't tell them the truth, will we? No, no, no. <laughs> they, they don't get to see those other no. versions that are buried no. under so many NDAs. No. Steve knows. <laughs> Steve, only the oh, Steve. Oh, I know. I know exactly <laughs> what's buried. I know exactly yes. what's in the box. Woohoo! What's in the box? 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 <laughs> Thank you so much for setting me up for a perfect segue. Absolutely. I loved it. You know what? That's a great ending to our interview. What? No, except that's a woman's thing. We better not do what's in but the box. You're an absolute <laughs> bastard, Steve. I was so working up to it. And you flew we in have and six stole of, it. We have six senses of humor. I love it. <laughs> Steve, bastard. What's in the box? <laughs> well, what's in the box is the part of the show where Andy tries to improve my movie education. He's going to put his hand into a box full of movie titles, which are all certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, and he's going to pull out a name. If I haven't seen it, then I go away and watch it the night before we record our next show. And if I have seen it, then we just keep pulling out names until we find one that I haven't seen. It's easy. Which usually you never really get past three before you found one that no. you haven't seen. If we get to four, then we're going to be seriously worried. Okay, well, I've started and I have found the first movie is Jeff Nichols' movie Shotgun Stories, which is a movie set in Arkansas and it tracks a blood feud that erupts between two sets of half brothers who come to blow at their father's funeral. Michael Shannon's in it. Really good movie as well. Have you seen it? Seen it. You have? No. <laughs> Bastard. Just when you're up. No, I haven't seen that one. I'm like, how How have you seen that and you haven't seen Taxi Driver? I don't know. <laughs> oh! oh! No, I oh. did see Taxi Driver. That was... that. Oh, I watched that. That came out of uh, what's in the box during the first series. Yes. We have no control over what comes out of the box. So you've got to add that to your slate of movies now that you've got to mm. watch. Yeah. So anyway, that has been an absolutely amazing show. Ellen, you've been an absolute joy. We're already looking forward to having you back again at yeah. some point in the future. Part Will two, you two be there? On. Oh, yes. Of course. Oh, then I'm not coming. Yeah. Oh, okay, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll leave we'll you build a Bill puppet. <laughs> I've never had more fun. And you know what? You're you're my first interview about Dune, so congratulations, guys. And I'm because I'm honoured really? to be interviewed by you. Seriously. Seriously. Oh, you're my first... Wow. Oh yeah, Andrew's very special, and now you're very special, Steve. Ter seriously, both of you. So. Well, my mum says that I'm special, but that's. Well. <laughs> Mum's always yeah. right. Mum's always right. You're, your friends say you're special as well, just not in the same way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Well, Anyway, we are at anyway. quarter past two in yes. the morning. Oh. And in the old days of the BBC, we'd usually have a white dot on our TV around now. Yes. Which means it is time. For Steve to go to bed. Yes. And just go to bed. And good Ellen night, to gentlemen. Enjoy the rest of her evening. Have a good night. With you that too. in mind, thank you very much once again, Ellen. And it is good night from me. Uh, 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 Thursday. And it's good night from him as well. <laughs> I 
Kopienko just stay up. <laughs> Kopienko in three hours. 